Right. Excellent. Well, welcome and good afternoon for those of you who are joining us East Coast or later. Good morning for those of you in, in other time zones. My name is Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research or SWHR. And as I was saying, we are really glad to have you here for today's conversation, Societal Influences Impact on Cardiovascular Disease in Women. And we're going to talk today about how social determinants of health and other factors might affect an individual's access to cardiovascular disease and screening. We want to thank today's sponsor, Amgen, for educational support for today's event and note that SWHR maintains independence and editorial control over work products and programming. And before we begin with our presentations and our conversation, just a few housekeeping items. Um, you know, we are recording this event. We are going to post this online. So we will be sure to share the recording with folks, whether uh, you were able to make it live with us right now, or if you're watching this recording later, if you registered, you will get the link. Um, to ask a question, use the Zoom Q&A function. We will be monitoring this for themes and we'll do our best to get to all of the questions, although often we are unable to fully answer all of the questions because we tend to get a lot of them during these um, conversations. There is a live transcription feature for this webinar. You can access that by clicking on CC Live Transcript at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, you may just need to resize your window to be a little bit wider. Um, and with that, we will talk just for a quick minute about SWHR. I cannot um, give up the opportunity. So for those of you who are new to us, um, we are a more than 30-year-old national organization dedicated to advancing women's health through science policy and education while promoting research on sex differences to optimize women's health. And our vision is to make women's health mainstream. We have a variety of scientific and policy programming across the lifespan, as you can see here, um, one of them being in the cardiovascular disease space, really looking at issues and conditions like heart disease, stroke, heart failure, and hypertension tension among others. Um, as you probably know, but may, you may not know, CVD is the leading cause of death in both women and men in the United States. And there are many risk factors associated with developing CVD, including older age, obesity, diabetes, inactivity, family history, smoking, et cetera, for both men and women. Um, but research has shown that there are significant sex differences between men and women when it comes to heart health. And so that's one of the reasons we look very closely at this as well. Um, heart health broadly is part of SWHR's Healthy Aging Network, which also includes Alzheimer's disease, bone health, menopause, and obesity. Um, for today's conversation, we're absolutely thrilled to be joined by two fantastic speakers, Dr. Lynn Bentke and Mandy Sandcooler. Dr. Bentke is a double, board, uh, double boarded family and psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Her areas of specialty include complex disease management, addictions, management of depression and anxiety, and integrative care. And her practice has been primarily in rural areas, including Northern Michigan and north of the Arctic Circle. She has extensive experience in diversity, equity, and inclusion activities as part of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and the LGBTQIA plus community. She's published on a variety of topics, including substance use and misuse, transitions of care, rural and indigenous vulnerable populations, and the danger of underdiagnosing microvascular disease in women. She's currently chair of the board of directors of Women Heart, the National Coalition of Women with Heart Disease. And we also today are joined by Mandy Sandcooler, who has worked with 13 years for the Mended Hearts, Inc., where she has had the opportunity to support and serve volunteers, patients, and families affected by heart disease. In her role as Director of Partnerships and Communications, Mandy works with MHI's partners and sponsors on funding opportunities, program design and deliverables, and advocacy initiatives, and oversees all Mended Hearts, Young Mended Hearts, and Mended Little Hearts chapters and groups. She also manages all the communications for the organization. So we are delighted to have you both here. Um, we're going to start with Lynn, and then we'll turn it over to Mandy, and then we'll all come back um, for some Q&A. Folks, if you just use the chat function um, if you need to, or um, use the Q&A as folks are talking, if something comes to mind, we will, we will be taking a look at that. All right, Lynn. 
Okay, we'll work on sharing my screen here. Okay, here we go. And what I'm excited to talk about today, um, I'm usually excited to talk period, but um, social determinants of health, societal influences on cardiovascular disease. Uh, let's move here. Okay, we had this worked out before. There we go. There go. I'm going to use um, Michigan as a microcosm for representation of cardiovascular disease um, in, in Michigan. And if you can see my arrow, I live right here in the midst of all this very dark red um, color, which shows that our cardiovascular disease hospitalization rate per 10,000 um, is around 187.7 to um, 253.2. But even worse is the mortality rates per 100,000 Michigan adults, uh, which is 285 um, to 352 per 100,000 adults. That's, that's the overall picture and what contributes to this. And I think one of the things that's really important is you look at the east side um, of the state as well as the west tip of the upper peninsula. And you can see the concentration of cardiovascular disease. So where we're going to start with that is looking at the social determinants of health. And number one is education, access, and quality. In, in Northeast Michigan, we have little opportunity for math, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. We don't have um, many brick and mortar. Uh, actually, we don't have any brick and mortar um, higher education. We do have some community colleges for which we're very thankful. The Northeast Michigan um, Community Action Agency has a very highly successful school success program that helps um, kids get through high school. And we recently received the governor's award for their, their success um, in working with kids at risk. All of our schools in our area are um, free and reduced lunch, which means that we have a significant level of poverty, uh, as well as that is a setup for um, decreased educational achieve achievement. And we know that in 2019, the American Heart Association identified that low educational achievement is inversely related to cardiovascular disease. So um, the less education, the higher your chances of um, cardiovascular disease. And one of the issues associated with that is looking at, um, for example, discharge instructions. There, sometimes I can't understand them and I, I have a doctorate in nursing. So um, looking at those kinds of basic patient education um, information, discharge instructions from the hospital, that may be why we have the hospitalization rate and then the death rate that we have um, for diseases, diseases particularly related to um, heart failure. Self-care is critical in order to live effectively and thrive with heart failure. And if, unless we teach people appropriately at their educational level, um, they're not going to be successful. So I, just a real quick little um, picture here. This is Ann Arbor Pioneer High School on the left. And this is Tawas Area Schools, which is our high school, middle school, and elementary school. So you can see that there's quite a difference um, between resources and access um, in terms of education. So the next social determinant of health, and actually I think of them as social drivers, not necessarily determinants. Drivers tend to be more action oriented. So it means that we're not just stuck with a determinant that says, okay, we're, we're not gonna do well. We have drivers, we have things that say there are implications for healthcare access. There's things that we can do. We do have a, a small hospital, um, which was recently sold. 
Um, the closest tertiary hospital is 90 miles. Um, generally, emergency access is via ambulance or a helicopter over Lake Huron. I've taken a few backward um, trips in an ambulance. It's not particularly pleasant. Um, there's a paucity of primary care health professionals. We are a medically underserved area as identified by HRSA. Um, we do have a lack of reliable internet. Um, hopefully that's going to improve and you'll see how fast our internet is. Cardiac rehabilitation is a crucial problem or crucial program uh, for women uh, with heart disease. But it's important to acknowledge that distance is a significant barrier for some patients, particularly women who are trying to go back to work. After I had my event um, in 2009, um, it was 40 minutes to cardiac rehab, an hour there and 40 minutes back. So I couldn't really go back to work as soon as I wanted to go back to work um, because I felt and research has shown that cardiac rehabilitation is a class 1A intervention for women with heart attack or with heart disease. Also, women don't get uh, referred. And if they do get referred, their attendance is low. So these are all research issues that we need to look at in terms of making sure that um, women have the best care that they possibly can post cardiovascular um, event. Many women are misdiagnosed, and this tends to happen um, particularly, it seems to me, in rural areas where we don't have access to all the um, current and wonderful research that's being done um, by SWHR as well as um, the women's uh, cardiologists. But frequently, women are sent home, patted on the head, and saying, oh, it's just a panic attack, or it's just anxiety, um, or excessive worry. And then the fourth trimester, which is interesting because we generally think that gestation is three trimesters, but the fourth trimester is when the body's going back to normal post-pregnancy. And this is where things such as hypertension, um, vitamin D deficiency, hypothyroidism, um, SCAD, which is uh, spontaneous coronary artery uh, disruption, these kinds of things happen during the fourth trimester and need to be evaluated. So our next um, social driver is neighborhood and built environment, um, social and community centers. We know that social interaction reduces people's um, difficulties with heart disease. On the far left here um, is the community health center at Point Hope, Alaska, which is above the Arctic Circle. I spent some time there working in their primary care clinic. Um, this is actually Tundra. Um, this was in the end of July of 2022. Um, and it was really an interesting um, place. And I don't have time to really go into, but um, the frontier aspects of healthcare. And it was interesting to me to find out that we actually have frontier areas in the upper peninsula of Michigan, but also all over the United States. Um, and frontier care is totally different than primary care in a suburban area. As you can see, our internet is faster than a rut and buck. Um, and for those of you who don't hunt, um, it's pretty fast, it's not really very fast actually. And then of course we have our own civic centers. And this is a picture of the Curtisville Civic Center, um, which kind of puts into perspective um, the resources that are available. The other parts of the neighborhood and built environments is if we want something, we have to do it ourselves, which, okay, um, we're pretty in a rural area, and that's one of the things I love about rural care and frontier care um, is that people are very hardy, they're very industrious and very creative. Um, we see the Lewis Rudman Children's Playground, and you can um, see that it was hand built. Um, it doesn't have cedar shakes or gravel, so you know we don't know any studies about kids being injured, but there is the merry-go-round that 
always made me sick when I was a kid, but you got to have one if you have a playground. You can see that sometimes we have some transportation tra um, challenges. But also, um, when we're talking about food availability, um, it's really critical for people with cardiovascular disease to watch their salt. And when we look at um, food supply, um, I, it actually took me two and a half hours in a Walmart to purchase low sodium foods for one of my patients. We can, um, so that we can reduce the sodium in our, um, our foods. And, and that is, I believe, cabbage salad and pickled beets. We need to think about trash, sewer, and septic. Um, in the frontier areas in Point Hope, there's really no way to get rid of trash. So unfortunately, it, there's a lot of um, old snowmobiles and four, four by fours because there are no roads. Um, tra travel is by bush plane. Um, tertiary hospitals are um, 500 miles from Point Hope. So it, that's a medical jet and prayer. Um, transportation is a challenge. And transportation in Northeast Michigan is a challenge. We do not have really um, community um, public uh, transportation. We are, we are praying for a train up the middle of Michigan. We also have a lack of exercise facilities. However, if your garden is plentiful, you can be gardening like mad. Um, roads, our roads, we have roads that have no names. We have houses that have no numbers. We have houses without floors, without um, wooden floors. They have just have dirt floors. Um, we have several hazardous sites. I'm, the PFAS has been an issue in Oscoda. And once again, healthcare is at paucity. If it weren't for um, advanced practice clinicians such as PAs and MPs, we wouldn't have very much at all. Our physicians are stretched and we're thankful for them because we all need to collaborate with them as well. In, an, in a rural area, the economic stability is really tough in some cases. We are lucky to have Coletta Air um, in Oscoda, which is a large um, Air Force, or not Air Force, it used to be an Air Force base. It's an uh, Air Force repair, plane repair and preparation area. However, they also contribute to um, the PFAS issues as well. Um, as a general rule, our economics are usually essential services such as public school, healthcare, long-term care facilities and tourist areas. We are very much a tourist area. All you have to do is try to turn on 23 after Memorial Day, it takes you five minutes. After Labor Day, it takes you two. Um, so we're, we're winding down. However, the other piece of that is you have to make your money in the summertime. Um, jobs are frequently minimum wage without benefits. Uh, we have a lot of retirees. That's everyone's dream. Um, downstate and downstate is anywhere below Saginaw. Um, the guys like to retire up north um, so they can hunt and fish. The wives come along. Um, and as a general rule, we have some beautiful uh, quilting uh, groups, but socialization for women has a tendency to um, fall by the wayside. We do have a lot of people with disabilities. Um, it is cheaper to live in Northeast Michigan. It used to be true, um, but however, rents and home prices are um, going up. We have an intersectionality with healthcare access, education, neighborhood and built environment is problematic. If we have pe poor people with multiple issues and we do have a lot of people with um, chronic diseases with the CVD, um, heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, um, all those cardiovascular diseases. Um, and it takes a lot to take care of patients um, with these kinds of issues. It takes a lot to get their medications prior authorized and those kinds of things. So women's lived experiences um, it's not uncommon for a woman, a middle-aged woman or a early 60s 
um, to be caring for an older parent or an older adult, as well as their children and grandchildren, still working a minimum wage job with unstable and inadequate health insurance. The uh, um, ACA has helped. However, um, when there's stretching dollars, healthcare is usually at the bottom of the priority pile. We do have, tend to have a lack of reliable transportation, a lack of reliable internet, um, and a lack of time, especially when they're caregiving for uh, older adults and kids and grandkids, um, and a place for exercise and stress reduction. We do have a beautiful community center, but uh, it's, it's not open 24 seven. And we also have, uh, sadly, um, an issue with domestic violence. We are at the 45th, 45th parallel. We're about 20, uh, 30 miles south of the 45th parallel, which puts us at very high risk for vitamin D deficiency, um, as well as a seasonal affective disorder. So we look at energy takers, things that are taking energy away from us um, and focusing on the past. Um, I'm not going to read all these to you, but um, very rarely do we have sedentary time. But overworking is a huge issue. Um, screen time, resentment, negativity, junk food. A lot of our foods are square, bought at the uh, local um, party store. Uh, we ha don't have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. And I have to tell you, I've been into um, tomato, onion, pickle sandwiches, um, Fresh tomatoes are just a, a gift from God, as far as I'm concerned, um, in those summertime. Energy givers are nature, and we have beautiful um, bike paths, and we live on the corner or on the edge of Lake Huron, which is absolutely gorgeous and gives us a lot of positivity and gratitude. Um, hydration, meditation can be a, a challenge when you have kids running about muck um, decluttering, um, be, having consistent sleep, eating whole foods, um, learning something new every day. And these are really high level activities that are difficult to do when people are working hard to care for their children um, and their grandkids. So all is not gloom and doom. However, we do know and it's very interesting that acoustic music remodels cardiovascular cells. And um, there's some really interesting work that has been done and is going on at Stanford University, Dr. Wu, um, who is finding out and researching music and remodeling of the cardiovascular cells. But in our little community, last night we had a concert and we actually had the composer, the lyricist, and the band play original music, which is kind of exciting in our little community. So we have the Taos Community Concert Band. We have the Taos Bay Players. Um, we have the Huron Shores Choir. We have the Taos Wellness um, Group, the, the Wellness Warriors. And all of this is working hard to move our um, our culture from beer and cigarettes to Pinot and running shoes. We also have the Northeast Michigan Community Service Agency to help with some of the other really significant um, social deter deter determinants and turning those into drivers. So um, I have to say, before I had my cardiovascular event, I was very much evidence-based book um, practice uh, way. However, since becoming a woman heart champion and being trained at the Mayo Clinic and the emphasis on the social drivers of health, I've been much more creative in my care of people, which is exciting to me and um, keeps me out of trouble. So that's the end of my presentation. And I'll go back to um, Kathy, Kate. Um, Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I have I have questions brewing in my mind. I would remind folks to please ask your questions in terms of um, 
the Q&A box and I'm going to turn it over to Mandy as she is getting uh, her portion of the presentation up and running. Um, oh, I, maybe while while Mandy, you're doing that, um, a person asked a question here about what type of music did you say? I have written down a, acoustic music um, has been found to remodel cardiovascular cells, uh, but we will get back to that as well. All right, Mandy. Great. Thank you, Katie. And thank you so much for having us here today. I want to talk about a topic that's really important not only to women who are living with heart disease or who've experienced a heart event, but really to anyone who is interacting with a healthcare team or who has a healthcare decision to make. Being an empowered patient and being part of a shared decision-making process is really important. Before I go into the details of that, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the organization that I've worked for now for over a decade, um, Mended Hearts, has been around for over 73 years. And we were established back in 1951 by four heart patients and a doctor who, who thought to themselves, wow, the recovery time for patients goes so much better and is so much faster when we have other heart patients to talk to. So that's what we were founded on, that peer-to-peer -peer support model. We have three programs, Mended Hearts, Mended Little Hearts, and Young Mended Hearts. And through those programs, we support people who are living with heart disease, all the way from um, infancy when they're born with a congenital heart defect, all the way up to members who are in their 90s or 100s. We have over 100,000 members living all around the world and over 50% of our membership um, is women. So we, we serve and provide support to a lot of women. We have over 200 chapters and groups around the country. And through those groups, we're able to provide peer-to-peer -peer support um, at the bedside of patients who are in the hospital or over the phone and through email and text. We hold monthly support and educational group meetings, uh, have fundraisers, do a lot of campaign awareness around heart disease. So as Lynn was talking about the communities that she serves, um, it's really important to have those uh, Zoom meetings that are available to anyone, no matter where they're at, in case they can't um, get out of their home and have access to in-person events. I also just wanted to briefly talk about the benefits of peer support, since that's what, that's what we do. And I know that's what Women Heart does as well. So really it's so important, especially as women are more prone to be affected by heart disease um, that's caused by anxiety and depression, being the par part of a superior peer support network like Mended Hearts or Women Heart reduces feelings of isolation and depression, creates those meaningful connections that are so important in isolated areas, especially like what Lynn referred to. And it helps women recognize and address family and community health issues that are specific to them. Being parts of groups like Mended Hearts um, meetings improve physical health, increase disease knowledge, improves understanding of medication and increases the access to health information. Because in those meetings or in educational webinars like these, you learn about heart conditions and different types of heart diseases, uh, treatments and therapies and ways to combat heart disease. And then finally, being part of a support network creates more confidence in decision-making networks. When you're in a meeting with someone who talks about the process they went through with their healthcare provider and the confidence they had, you're going to take on some of that confidence and know that you too can have that type of shared decision making. Which takes me into the main part of my um, presentation today, which is the seven steps to becoming an empowered patient. And that starts with taking control and then educating yourself, knowing your rights, being part of the team, getting the right information, voicing your opinion, and making decisions that are right for you. And I'm going to briefly talk about each of these so that you have a better understanding of what they each entail. So taking control, it's really easy when you get a heart diagnosis, I think, or have an event to kind of want to put your head in the sand and just forget about it. You can go through shock and anxiety and stress, but it's really important that you take ownership of what's happened to you and realize that you are not, you know, part of heart disease. You have heart disease. You're not, don't let it 
overtake you, take control of it, and you get to decide what happens. And the first way you do that is to start to do your research. And you can do that online if you can't get out of your house, if you're in an isolated area or, or you don't have a lot of uh, healthcare resources around you, go online, but don't go to Dr. Google. Go to established resources like Mended Hearts Resources or Women Heart or the American Heart Association or the CDC, but go to places that have accurate information. You can also go to social media sites, but make sure that they are they're accurate and that they are not you know, trying to sell you anything and that they have the correct information. You want reputable sites. And then join communities that are online so you can learn more, learn more from other patients as well as um, educational resources. So take control, step one. Step two is to educate yourself. I think knowledge is power and no matter what you're, in, you know, in coming into contact in your life, having power and the knowledge of something you know, it it really, it's an abyss. It's an abyss if you don't have control and knowledge of what you're about to go into. So only when you understand your condition and the treatment options that are available to you, can you make an informed choice that's going to fit your lifestyle because everyone's different and no choice is right for this, for any two people, right? Everyone, everything is going to look a little bit different. So you educate yourself starting by having your healthcare provider fully explain your condition and treatment options, asking questions and keep asking until you understand and asking about the resources that you can go to once you leave the doctor's office. Some of the things you can do when you go into the doctor's office or the healthcare provider's office, go in with questions, have them written down. That way you're, you're not gonna miss something when you get in there and, and you realize you don't have as much time as you thought you'd have, or you just get anxious or overwhelmed. Keep asking questions until you understand. This is truly a case where no question is a stupid one. You wanna make sure you understand the whole process thoroughly. And then you also can do things like take someone with you into the appointment in case you are anxious and in case you do forget things, that other person probably has a clearer head. You can ask the healthcare provider if they're, you're allowed to record the conversation. That way you can take that back and, and afterwards when you're calmer, you can go through it. Um, those are all, I think, good things to do uh, when you're going into the initial appointment with the doctors or nurses, which can be very quick. They have a limited amount of time. So you wanna make the best use of your time. Step three is to know your rights and know that you are the top decision maker. It's your health and your body. And you need to know that you have the right to be treated as part of the team. And I'm gonna get into more of that on the next slide. You have the right to ask questions and get answers, the right to be heard, the right to your own medical records, especially if you're going back and forth between different specialists and maybe those records aren't coordinated in any one place. You have the right to know what's being said about you. Get a second opinion and a third and a fourth. And I know that's not easy, especially in communities like the one that Lynn is uh, that Lynn's been working with and talking about. Sometimes it's hard to even get a first opinion in those communities. But if you do have the option to go and get a second opinion or a third one, that's your right. If you feel uncomfortable and you feel like you're not getting the answers you deserve, then then do your best to um, work with another healthcare provider. You are able to suggest alternatives. You are able to ask thing about things like clinical trials. Is there a clinical trial in this area for me? Um, that, that's your right. And you have the right to feel confident in the team. And you have the right, finally, to change your mind. If you've gone through a process and you get to the end of that process and you're about to have a procedure or a treatment or therapy and you're not comfortable with it, that's okay. And it's your right to change your mind. And then finally, appeal those decisions if you don't agree. The next step is to be part of the team. And this is really, I think, takes it back to, as women, we don't always feel like we have that equal seat at the table. I think patients in general feel that way, especially when they're dealing with heart surgeons or doctors and nurses who've been training for decades to get to where they're at. You automatically feel like they have the most knowledge. And of course they do, certainly they do, but you are the you expert. In order to be an empowered patient, you have to realize that your opinions are just as important and you don't wanna be passive in this. 
You want to be able to let people know what your healthcare goals are, what your preferences are. A woman who is going through menopause and experiencing a heart event is going to have a different treatment plan than a woman who just had a, had a child. To, it's it's people, every single person is different and the way women are treated are different than the way men should be treated. Um, and so you need to make sure you're telling your healthcare team what your goals are for when the procedure or the treatment is over and, and everything that's important to you, your healthcare team needs to know that. You know yourself better than anyone and um, understand that healthcare professionals, I think Lynn's the perfect example, wants you to be engaged and involved. And, and they, they know that if you're engaged in that process, Afterwards, when it comes to taking your medication and sticking to your nutrition plan and getting the exercise you need, if you've helped plan that, you are more likely to stick to it than say a doctor just says, you you need to do this and this and this, and you just shake your head mutely and say, okay, but are you really engaged and invested in that plan? No, not unless you've had a piece of it. The next point here is to get information. So even if you've educated yourself about your condition and your treatment information, there's gonna be specific information you might wanna know about, let's say the outpatient clinic or the hospital where you're having your surgery or your medical procedure. So you can ask questions like, how often have you performed this procedure? What's your success rate? And what's your survival rate? Um, especially for you know a heart transplant or very serious open heart surgeries, you, this is information you will want to know. What's the average recovery time at the hospital? Do patients fully recover? What complications can occur? And how does the healthcare team work together? And can you meet everyone on the team? And then finally, what resources are available after your surgery or your procedure? Are you going to have help figuring out your insurance? Are you going to have help if you need a counselor after, if you're going through any type of, you know, anxiety or, or um, just, you know, frustrations with your, your treatment plan, is there anyone to talk to after that about that? And so um, make sure you ask those questions. Step six is to remember that your voice matters and your story matters. And if you're uncomfortable, don't be afraid to speak up. So who is it important to discuss the issue with? Be courageous and speak up on important issues. You can be respectful and courteous in your actions, but still be assertive. Ask for a response uh, for any information or resources needed. Advocate for yourself like you would for a loved one or a best friend and get that support you need. I think that advocating for yourself like you would for a partner or a best friend or a child or a parent is the best advice that we can give you. Because I think as um, women, especially, we tend to step back. We put everyone else's uh, thoughts and feelings ahead of ours and we're in the background. And if this is happening to you, you need to put yourself at the front of the line. And then finally, even if you're not having surgery, you still could be taking medications or going through outpatient procedures uh, that are going to have an impact on you. And that could have an impact on you for the rest of your life if you're diagnosed in your 30s or 40s or 50s. So these are questions you want to ask your healthcare team. What are your treatment options? What are the risks and benefits of each treatment option? Who's the best person to perform this? What happens if you choose not to have this treatment? How do you find out if you can afford this treatment? That's super important. Can you get this treatment or medication that's being prescribed? Because that's that can be a huge issue with things like step therapy and uh, with certain conditions, you're gonna have to go through a series of medications before you finally get the one that you and your doctor know you needed in the first place. And then what kind of lifestyle changes will you need to make? This is really important. If you're going on a medication or getting a treatment or therapy, you know, to think about if you've got children at home, if you have a busy work lifestyle, if you're caring for your parents, can you keep up with all of that with the treatment plan you're on? And then finally, what's the recovery like for the different treatment options? You wanna be clear about all of this. And if you do all of these steps, this is what shared decision-making should look like. You should have an understanding of your condition, 
You should understand the treatment options that are available to you. You have the time to consider your options if possible. This is you know, not true if you have a heart attack and you're rushed in for emergency surgery, but you certainly will have options once you've been fixed up and you're now learning to live with um, what your life looks like after a heart attack. Questions, have you been able to ask all the questions and get the answers you need? Do you feel supported in your decisions? And lastly, are you comfortable and confident with those decisions? And so that's all I have for you today, but um, I'm gonna stop share now. And uh, Katie, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Mandy. That was wonderful. And I see some great comments coming in um, right now. And so one of the one of the things that I think about, and I'm so glad that you said this, Mandy, was treat your own health and and the approach to how you treat your own health as if it were not you, which seems super counterintuitive, right? To how we would we would normally speak. But I think in particular for women, it is everything else that is coming first. And so you may be ignoring signs or symptoms. You may not be able to get to um, you know, a clinician appointment or, you know, you may have many other things going on, particularly as we think about these um, societal influences as well and this all coming together. So I really appreciate that you share that point in particular because it crosses all of the areas that we engage in and we just hear it more and more often. Um, I think we all sort of live with that as well. If, you know, if you're caring for an aging parent or a child, um, families, friends, et cetera, I think these are things that that hopefully women can take away with them. My first question for is really for you both, but really about how we can sort of marry these concepts, right? We know that maybe uh, the sense of empowerment and how we uh, get to people where they are looks different depending on who you're talking to um, and how you're trying to access them. So I wonder, Maybe Lynn, you can start with like, how are you getting these types of messages across to to different people and in different ways, and and what does that look like from your perspective? Thank you, thanks, Katie. Um, in a rural area, and Mandy, your presentation was fabulous and covered all the key issues. And one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that there are a lack of services. There are social drivers and determinants of health that are preventing women from getting the help that they need. Women Heart um, is a coalition of women's organizations. We train champions at the Mayo Clinic, which is phenomenal because you see all the most magical, wonderful medical equipment um, present, but in those rural areas, they're not necessarily there. However, you do have the knowledge, as you indicated, of being empowered to approach your healthcare provider and say, hey, maybe I need to go, to, maybe I need to go to Mayo, or maybe I need to go to Ann Arbor, or maybe I need to go to a major medical center. Um, in terms of get, creating health equity, which is a other, another whole topic, um, to try and achieve that, there's many groups that are doing mobile units. Um, we do mobile um, preschool screenings through NEMSCA. Um, all those kinds of things help. There's um, what are called RAMS, and it's healthcare in rural areas across the United States where a whole weekend is spent with screening um, activities and they have dentistry and veterinary even as well as um, medicine, OB-GYN, all these things. So recognizing that there are these lapses and trying really hard such as Mended Hearts is and such as Women Heart um, are doing to try to bridge these gaps is how right now how we have to do it but also working with SWHR um, and Catherine and her group, as well as the Corey and several other research um, organizations, hopefully in the very near future, we're gonna have better answers. Mandy, how are you getting the word out about you, the peer support groups? Where are you finding people? Is it, does it look different for different people? Yeah, we rely a lot on partnerships with hospitals. 
because that's where the not that's that's where the people living with heart disease are you know they're being treated patients are being treated in the hospital so we do rely on that a lot i think covid one of the silver linings that we've all heard in this industry is that it's brought people together so it has enabled organizations like Women Heart and Mended Hearts to reach people that we could never have reached before, which in those underserved communities is so important because even if they can't see people in person and they can't get that support in person, they can at least do it online and they can feel less alone, which is the first step to getting support of any type is to know they're not, they're not alone and people out there care about them. And so through our, through our hospitals and through partnerships with organizations, we partnered with Women Heart and being on you know, webinars like this, this opportunity, uh, we're grateful for that because that's how we also get the word out. Great. Um, one of the things that I really love that you both did was really talk about that intersectionality when you think about women and, and to get to your point about health equity, Lynn, there's so many identities, right? When it... For all people, but I think when we think about women, um, you may be approaching not just your health, but your life in a number of different ways. And, and you may uh, identify, you know, as a woman or a mom, you may be a woman of color, you may be a woman who's in a rural area, women of particular ages. And there's just so many things that go into that identity that then impact how you are treating yourself or your health or your access to care and all of that. So this intersectionality piece, I think, is really critical when we think about um, women's health and cardiovascular disease. Um, one of the questions that I have for you, Lynn, is as a clinician and really thinking about how do we take what we're hoping that you know patients themselves will bring to the table in terms of understanding what's going on with them and asking the right questions and feeling empowered. How do we address this on the clinician side? What, what's your advice to clinicians when they have a patient in front of them who's asking these types of questions? First of all, don't be threatened. Um, yeah, and also don't automatically think that they've gone to Dr. Google. Um, several, a lot of times we as clinicians, we're busy we're on, we're on a schedule. Um, and I've always been a person that my schedule is what the patient needs. Um, so consequently, I may be scheduled for 15 minutes, but it's going to take me 25. So that's going to put me behind through the day. However, my patient population understands that, that they will too get their time. Don't be threatened. Um, look at the literature. Be excited. Understand that women's um, cardiovascular disease is really underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and there are really, and part of that is because we didn't have the tools um, in the past to care for these issues. And we do, we have medications now, we understand about cardiac rehab, we understand that the instrumentation or the types of um, um, Angi angiogram tubes and those kinds of things are, are scaled down for women's size. Personally, I was on the intraaortic balloon pump after one of my angiograms um, and the balloon was too big and it, it caused significant problems. Even to this day, it causes problems. Those issues have been addressed. People are, are looking at those kinds of things and uh, looking at Dr. Wu and his I'm just so excited about this music thing. Um, but prevention, make sure that the hypertension is treated. Um, don't treat it as a failure. Don't think as a failure. And you as a clinician, me as a clinician, react to that blood pressure. Even if it's white coat hypertension, that means that's the blood pressure that people have when they're under stress. And who isn't under stress? So... Clinicians need to keep at the front of their mind that heart disease is the number one killer of, of women. Um, and we never thought that before. We thought the guys were all going to fall off before we did. And that's not true. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And it is something that I, I think we still see to this day is that misperception that this isn't a quote unquote women's health issue, right? That it's 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 not uh, as impactful as, as something we might otherwise think of as a women's health issue. And so I think for, for all of us really raising that awareness for everyone because it's it's still an issue and we need to make sure we're addressing it. It's being identified um, both in terms of knowing your own signs and symptoms, but also in terms of, of the clinicians looking at it and then obviously marrying that with the research, which we always like to see. But th this is what we're talking about when we talk about sex differences research, that whether it's sort of what the end user or the end treatment might look like. Does it need to be a different size? Is there something that's a little bit different about men and women? We know we're different. <laughs> it's acknowledging it. Um, or maybe there are better treatments available. Maybe the symptoms look different, which we know to be true as well. Very so I think, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, Mandy, anything on the, any advice for clinicians as you're thinking about, right, we're working to empower the patients. What would you like to see them do? I think that I would just like to see them understand more that there is a there is empowerment there is power in their patient being knowledgeable and being educated and and I think it's based maybe that a younger generation coming up when they're being trained in medical school now I know they're being trained now more on being an empowered on that shared decision-making process. Whereas 50 years ago, 40 years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, I, the more that that training takes place um, in their schooling years, then they're gonna carry that throughout their career. So just understanding the value of a patient being knowledgeable and having a voice. I'd like to add to that, Mandy, just for a minute. Um, I am a woman with heart disease. I, at, 50, I had um, bypass surgery. Um, then I had a couple of heart attacks and then I had a ruptured artery. Um, and that has really made me pay attention as a clinician because I missed my own symptoms. I, I worked in critical care for years um, and I had a funny, funny discomfort in my neck. And I tried my own acupuncture, chiropractic, all this kind of thing. Um, not ever thinking that it was uh, cardiac. And I called my um, nurse practitioner on, Mon on Monday. This happened over a weekend. I called my nurse practitioner on Monday and said, hey, Deb, I, I, I think I need um, an MRI of my neck. And she said, well, Lynn, let's talk about this for a minute. You just turned 50. You're hypertensive. You used to smoke. You're overweight. You have a terrible family history. I think we need to do a stress test. And that really obviously saved my life. And so consequently, that attention to those kinds of risk factors, back then we did understand the pregnancy risk factors such as preeclampsia, hypertension, um, the uh, gestational diabetes. We didn't have those as the risk factors. So um, paying attention to what we know as risk factors is really critical and listening to our own bodies really um, and not just deny um, that little pain in the neck. <laughs> and also, if I may add, what a gift, Lynn, that you had that kind of relationship that you could just call her up and have that conversation. And I think that goes into, if you have the luxury of having a second opinion or a third opinion, if you don't feel comfortable and have that kind of relationship, you can try to find it. And many women do feel more comfortable with a female um, physician or physician's assistant or, you know, nurse practitioner. So that's, that's okay. If that's your comfort level, then try to find someone, a woman who works for you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point too. When we think about on sort of how do we close some of these disparities that we're seeing, and and again going back to sort of these societal impacts, the workforce piece is a really important one as well. And I know obviously in heart health we think of cardiology, and you know we're seeing better numbers of of women and in in the cardiology field. It's certainly not enough. I think we'd love to see more, and in particular we'd love to see. Um, more women of color become cardiologists. That's a very small proportion of cardiologists. So really thinking about 
Um, how are we accessing clinicians who we are comfortable with as patients and that we trust uh, to be able to give us this advice? So I think that's another piece of this that's that's really critical here. And I appreciate you bringing that up. And Lynn, I appreciate you sharing your own story too. I think it's really powerful um, to really be thinking about some of this stuff. One of the things I know, Lynn, we have talked about before was sort of the, the access in rural areas, right? And, and what does that mean um, if you are forever away from, from being able to get the care that you need. Um, there is a question here um, in the Q&A asking about if there are any national initiatives, public or private, to reduce disparity of care or lack of services in rural areas in particular. But I also think, A, that's one piece. I would maybe add to that um, a question about, you know, access do, is not only, access issues are, is not exclusive to rural areas. We are seeing access issues um, in other communities as well. But I, I wanted to see if you had thoughts on, on that particular question. Um, another issue in terms of access um, is recently my hospital system that I go to was hacked with ransomware. And I was actually supposed to have um, a, a procedure at the end of this month that I can't have because I won't go to that facility when they don't have any IT. And my my vascular surgeon said, "Uh, uh you know, this isn't this isn't urgent. It's not critical. We can wait. Let's get things back." So that's an access issue as well. But there are um, ARPA H and there are um, women's health dollars for research on how to improve access. Um, and, you know, it's such, it's such an all-encompassing, um, huge issue. You, we have to approach it like you, you would eat a whale, and that's one bite at a time, um, and try to find these um, effective evidence-based interventions um, the internet, we really want the internet, but there's places two miles out of town here, there's no internet. And so consequently building that infrastructure, and I think that's happening. When we're looking at the political situations, we need to think about those kinds of issues. What, what can be done from an in infrastructure point of view? Um, what can be done in terms of a health system? And I think the health system movement and interaction um, is a, a key piece. Um, you say you're talking about um, cardiologists, having more cardiologists, women of color. It's too late when you get to the cardiologist. Sure. The primary wow. care, and I keep saying this, and I, of course, I was banging on my table and the dog's barking, so sorry <laughs> about that. But primary care should be looking at these risk factors and increasing the access to the cardiologist. And I, I keep saying that um, because it's true. We, we need to prevent the disease. We need to treat the hypertension. We need to keep from the vessels becoming occluded and those kinds of things. And I'll get off that soapbox. No, I think you're right. I think you're totally right. Mandy, anything you wanted to add there? <laughs> No, I, I think Lynn said it all and, and I uh, completely agree. It, it I think what's so sad is that many people don't even have a GP. That's the tough part. They don't even have the option to see a cardiologist because they're not even seeing a doctor regularly, which is a huge issue. Yeah, I think making sure you know your health status is really critical. That's another piece of this as well. Um, I see we have one minute um, that went by very fast, I, very last, very quickly. <laughs> um, what's the one thing you want folks to take away from today's conversation? And we can go Lynn and Mandy, and then I'll wrap it up. I'm going to go quickly. Be involved. Know your body. Get connected and don't be afraid to have a voice. Excellent. I think those are excellent pieces of advice. Um, we do. I do see a question here on uh, support groups. We'll make sure we share links to things of the, that have been referenced and, and organizations and um, in particular, um, Mended Hearts and Women Heart um, as well. Great resources for folks here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Mandy. We so appreciate you all taking this time. I think that early, you're right, Lynn, it's, it's early. Uh, 
access intervention and knowing what you need to do to be able to live as well as possible for the rest of your life and those risk factors, particularly when it comes to heart health, um, I think we often miss. So thank you both for what you do and for joining us. Thank you, uh, folks in the audience. We will send out the recording. I know we've gotten a couple of questions. I promise you we'll send it to you once it's ready, as well as some links to um, additional information um, and, and organizations so that you also can empower yourself in your own health. And as always, stay connected with us via social media channels. Um, we'll share other groups as well. Um, thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.